So I'd like to give a little introduction. Uh, today I'm talking to uh, Bruce McKinney of uh, Rare Book Hub. Um, now I would say uh, the Rare Book Hub is essentially, a, it's a very vast and growing database of rare book auction records and dealer sales records. Uh, and Bruce and his site have really transformed, uh, you know, the rare book world by increasing the transparency of sales data for dealers, collectors, for researchers. Uh, and I can honestly say that most dealers today that I know do not buy a book before they check uh, the sales records on Rare Book Hub, as well as, let's say, the frequency uh, with which the book appears at auction. So Bruce, I'm gonna give you the floor to start. Uh, give us a bit about a, a little bit of your personal background uh, when, and most importantly, why did you start the Rare Book Hub? Yeah, well, the background, the background is deep, and it's, it's because, uh, I mean, it, it goes, goes to a time when I was about nine or 10 years of, of age. I was hyperactive, I was very smart, and, um, and, uh, and my mother was feeling like, uh, she, she was kind of the way she would describe it. You're driving me nuts. What do you need? What do you need? Because what are you looking for? And, uh, and I said to my mother, I was around 10. And I said that I was interested. I'm interested in old books. And she goes, and she was a, a country uh, newspaper editor, very well connected, a literate person. And she said, okay, okay, you want, you're interested in old books? I'm gonna create an appointment. And, she, and uh, uh, I was um, taken to, to a fellow who was the, um, he was the county historian for Ulster County. And, uh, uh, and he was also, he was kind of a dealer. He really was a collector dealer who was most reluctant to sell. He really didn't want, you know, oh, you want the last thing, the last thing he ever wanted to hear was you want, oh, you do want it? Oh my God. I know the type. Yeah, uh, I think I should have charged you more money because I didn't really want to sell it. Uh, and um, that was, uh, I, I was, I got a very quick sense uh, that, uh, that the history of and the area that I was living in was in New Paltz, New York, in Ulster County. The um, that um, uh, had a deep history, and uh, and that there were things around, and uh, so it was like, yeah, I'm kind of kind of liking the idea, and I started to uh, I figured out there were various book barns people who didn't want to throw the stuff out, they put him in the barn kind of thing. Sure. And uh, so I got that, um, I got that first taste and I found it, I found it, uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it was, um, I went on to start building, building businesses in my early twenties and- uh, Businesses outside of the rare book world. Oh yeah, not in the rare book world. No, no, I was building, I was starting to build, I, the first business I built was a, uh, was called the Orange County Free Press. That was a big business. And uh, that was, I had a wonderful success very fast. I started when I was 25. I sold it, I sold it uh, 17 months after I started it. Uh, and I, uh, a group called Corland Communications in Cleveland, Ohio, they kind of tapped me on the shoulder and goes, you know, fella, that's something we should own. What do you, what is your price? Nothing you better. You want it here when you're 26. Sure. So, uh, what that did was uh, uh, it allowed me uh, very quickly uh, to think about what I really want to do in life, which was I wanted bigger challenges than, than, working in Ulster County. And uh, so uh, I would ultimately uh, build businesses in Asia starting from uh, 1975 
to uh, 1990. And in each case, I would build the business. I would turn it into, into kind of turn it into something that really thrives. And then I sold them. Uh, and, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, uh, my wife uh, and my wife, Jenny, and I, we concluded that um, uh, we wanted to, we we're going to move back to the United States. Uh, we have been living in Taiwan. Uh, that would, um, that led me uh, in 1990 to start to try to uh, understand the rare book field. Uh, and um, I had no idea, I'd never heard of the ABA. I didn't know anything like that. Uh, uh, and, uh, but uh, I ultimately was, it was suggested that I would try this, reach this guy, Reese, this guy, Reese. Sure. And uh, that would um, uh, that would turn it into a great relationship. So for those who don't know, because it goes out to a wider audience, uh, Bill Reese was really oh, yeah. the preeminent uh, dealer in rare books of our generation and a friend of yours and somebody uh, you work with regularly to purchase books from. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was... He was he was superb when you if you came with the instinct to collect. Um, I I recall very clearly him saying, "Well, tell me what you're what you're thinking about," and of course, what Bill was able to do if what any any direction you went, uh, he could oh, okay, it would be that. How about I'll, I'm going to develop a list for you. I'll send you some items. You'll get some some idea what's involved uh, and uh, and my quick instinct was and I, I uh, decided to build a, a library of bibliography because I was had been out of the game for a long time and wanted to understand it so so I acquired a lot of bibliography um, and um, uh, and in 1991, beginning to think, well, I'm starting to know just a little bit. Uh, uh, I, went, I went to London. Uh, there, was a, uh, there were some auctions. Uh, got involved with uh, uh, Mags Brothers. And, um, uh, and I began to quickly understand that um, the... Uh, that the there was while there were many resources american book prices current has always done a nice job for that um uh, but, resources for pricing information you're talking about well rarity particularly rarity um rarity and, and valuation but uh as well uh uh what was needed to under to be understood is relative quality because there, there was in a simplistic way, oh, you want a copy of this? We have a copy of that. But those copies, it turns out, those copies were run from quality one, from quality one to quality 10. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and you'll see one price, and it would turn out sometimes that the very best copy was the 10. Sure. That was yeah. also the only one to buy. If you're ever really going to own it, you want to own that one. That was the that would be the that would be the author's copy with their notes and corrections, things like that. Well, let me ask you this: most successful business people uh, who go into the rare book world, you know, as collectors, they do what you do. They start uh, researching bibliographies, pricing information like that, but it, they don't necessarily focus on the rare book world as a potential business opportunity. You had an entrepreneurial spirit. What made you decide to uh, create a database of pricing? Well, um, there were two reasons. The first was that the, I did not find, frankly, I mean, I just have to be frank. I didn't find a very strong correlation between the prices being offered uh, with, uh, with auction realizations, 
I, I'm like I'm looking at that difference, and because I'm I'm a mathematician, that's really what I am. I'm, I'm a numbers person, and um, and I I could a quick I quickly calculated that the rate of the the rate at which prices were increasing um, at uh, at auction at auction the prices were increasing, but I mean, and they were pretty good. Today we can look back, oh, those are pretty, those are the halcyon powerful days, but that was maybe five to 7% a year. And um, uh, so I'm looking at that. I think if I want to build a collection, how do I be assured that I'm, that I'm not in a fool's paradise? If I'm, if I'm, I was willing to put, frankly, and ultimately did put millions of dollars into it but I want it to be a competent process. And ultimately what that meant was, um, and of course, I mean, I would say that um, uh, very quickly on, I became a, a subscriber to American Book Prices Current. And, um, and I thought that was a very good service, um, but uh, there were real limits. There were limits of what the coverage was. And, um, uh, and uh, in 19, in, in 2002, I thought, uh, well, I could see ahead. There was something that my family had spoken about when I was growing up. We, we was always to be, and when in life, we were, we were always to have a purpose. And, um, and the, the part about building businesses and making money, uh, that part, I'm stone cold perfect on that stuff. I'm very good, but there was there was a term that was used within the family, uh, and my my mother on Thursday after that Thursday at six o'clock every Thursday we would have family we would have family dinner, and um, I was to sit to the right of my mother. We had we had it was almost like place settings for each person. And I sat to the right, and um, and she would start her Sunday dinners. Excuse me, her her, uh, her dinners on there were Thursdays. Um, she said she would ask this start the the uh, dinner same way with the question, "What did you do today to get your obituary in the New York Times?" <laughs> And, and we would go around, you had, we knew from week to week, we had to be able to make our case. We were able to explain what we had done in the last seven days since our last discussion, what were we doing to, to make a life meaningful? And uh, so when I got to the, when I got uh, in, in 2002, um, you know, I thought uh, what I would like to do is to build a bridge to the next generation of book collectors. I wanted to build the bridge. That was the stated objective on day one. And I've never, never deviated from it whatsoever. I want collectors to feel, uh, to have a, a sense of, uh, I want them to feel the excitement. Sure. And I want them to feel relative safety. They want it's a it's a very emotional field, uh, and you have to kind of calm down and to say, "Wow, yeah, that's really great." Yeah, you really sure. have it. So uh, that prompted me to start to start Rare Book Cup, which I have to be very clear. I knew that what I was going to do because I'm. Uh, I'm I'm very intense. My approach is extremely intense. Um, I I contacted the Leibs, and I told them what I was going to do. And they had had a long history in the field. At American Book Prices Current, you're talking. Yes, about. and I I um, uh, to tell them, listen, I'm going to do it differently. This is going to be a much more expensive, deeper project. Uh, and I don't want to hurt you. Uh, I, I suggest 
that you simply think if you're if you're of a mind to uh, to retiring, sell it to me. I'll start I'll start with the bones of that project and I'll build it on. Uh, and um, Mrs. Lee kind of kept leading me on, uh, you know, every month or so, but nothing quite being resolved. Yeah. And it became very clear because I do deals. That's part of my business. And uh, I, I know exactly what that means. And uh, so I, I had to, uh, uh, I had to go off to do it on my own. Gotcha. And six months later, I was very pleased, very happy. I hadn't done it because when you really got into the field, more information was required. Sure. And, and I just felt, you know, okay, I wanna be a more, it's a more intense process. Well, that's a very interesting point, first of all, about more information, because I want to just to dispel that, you know, your site, Rare Book Hub, is just a pricing tool, because what it really is, is a research tool. And when you say you're reaching out to a new generation of collectors, the modern generation is especially interested in research. You know, this is the Google generation. Right. And one of the tools that I'm most impressed with at the touch of a button, and I can give you an example recently, you know, if you take uh, at the New York Antiquarian Fair, uh, you know, uh, Jim Cummins and Mags Brothers uh, put on and displayed a uh, manuscript of Charlotte Bronte, a juvenile manuscript yeah. that was discovered very recently and sold for $1.3 million. And what's interesting about that is using your database at the touch of a button, you can immediately see the last appearance of it is at auction was in 1916. Yeah. Uh, and even before then, two years ago, that was in New York, it was sold in London uh, you know, in 1914. And you can trace whose sale it belonged to and how it got into the, into the public. Uh, and then it's a little bit of a mystery, perhaps, you know, what happened in those two intervening years when it crossed the pond. Right. But that would, sort of research was almost impossible 20 years ago. I mean, you would have to scour research libraries. And here you have a story to tell of how an important manuscript, perhaps the single most important uh, juvenile literary manuscript, <laughs> you know, was, was purchased and saved and transported and then resold and, you know, hidden for so long. It's really wonderful, you know. That's the, that's, you know, the best we can hope for that uh, if that uh, an acquirer, whether it's an institution, collector, dealer, whoever, that they can uh, uh, find that in their random searches, they're looking things up and, uh, and they go, oh, Jesus, look at that. I'm going to get that. Oh, my Lord. I don't think they have a clue what they got. This is very important. Uh, it's just so much fun to be able to make those kinds of, of discoveries. Uh, it really, it, it, uh, it drives the passion of the field. Yeah, it's a tremendous thing. Let me ask you this. How do you think your database has actually affected rare book values in terms of pricing or at least perception of value now? It, it has an enormous impact and we know we know exactly what has happened when we started when we started to uh, to build the database in 2002 when we opened on the 3rd of uh, September 2002 we had 151,000 records they were mostly bibliographical never really never really thought that auctions were going active auctions were going to be part of this. It didn't really quite get that. Uh, but it, it quickly, it became apparent that the, the action were in the auction rooms. And uh, once we started to see that, uh, you, you, you started to get, you, you started to have some clarity about how the, about how the, the process works. It was very different. Uh, we did initially, we were covering uh, 35 auction houses, some of them pretty thin, not too many sales, uh, but uh, what we could find, what we could get. Uh, 
but by around 2004, auction houses began, the, who were very indifferent to us initially, they were tolerating us. That was it. Because sure. they were very committed to American book prices current. They had a very, very strong loyalty. Uh, but around 2004, well, I mean, okay, you can do it. Try it. Uh, and uh, But then what began to happen, the number of auctions they that started to we started to work with that be really began to dramatically increase we now have over 450 auction houses and now it's a little misleading because if uh, like christie's is uh probably i uh, god knows how many maybe 12 12 locations or whatever they are but they're listed 12 in 12 different places they sure. sell different places but it's 450 now 451 or 453. Um, and what we saw uh, over these 20 years is we've seen uh, we've seen that more and more people have become have become auction houses themselves. Sure. And and uh, we 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 try in the ways that we can to understand the financial outcomes for the for the auction houses and they have done very very well that that business model for 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 auctioning was something that was attracting a larger audience sure and they were getting good they were getting good prices uh and um uh, you know, maybe five years ago, it was become very, I mean, you know, you could really feel this attention in the marketplace uh, with, um, uh, uh, it was always a dealer dominated business yeah. and, and it worked very well that way, except that uh, the almost a constant refrain of dealers over over many many decades has been they've never been finding they rarely find new collectors of real substance uh, and what we could see because of our life of our uh, auction services we were starting to attract an audience of wealthy wealthier kind of individuals that were you could see their what they're buying is not because we're peeking or looking, we know it's none of our business, sure. but uh, it gave us an opportunity to actually speak with these people. Yeah. Or they will call us, they will have questions. How do they do something? So, well, yeah. in some ways, it mirrors a little bit of the, the stock market of years past. You know, you would have a bid and an ask, and there was a little sense of mystery, you know, to trading desks. And when it became more of, a market price and people have confident in the in the data sets and the auction records and things like that you broaden the the field to invite a lot of people you know to purchase books i want to say you know yeah that analogy is 100 percent correct i had you know when you're i was an early user of your database of course uh and maybe 20 years ago i initially had mixed feelings about it in the sense that one I didn't like, you know, if I purchased a book at auction, uh, that anybody who I want to sell it to could immediately find out where I purchased it and what I paid for it. Uh, and two, you know, there is a dealer, uh, because of his experience or her experience, you know, handling a lot of books over time, uh, like in the business world, you develop a moat of expertise in terms of your appraisals, uh, you know, for material. And uh, you, your database essentially reduced that moat. It made a lot of, you know, beginning collectors, uh, you know, be able to uh, quickly evaluate, you know, the reasonable price of a book. So I was curious, how was your database generally perceived in the book community, at least early on? Um, well, you know, the very, the, um, uh, the first, the first uh, person to sign up for our services was Bill Reese. He was number one. Sure. Uh, we made the offer. It was total silence. And then being uh, Bill Reese comes in to do it. And um, uh, 
there was uh, we made we made an offer to ABAA members. Uh, would uh, we gave them a free trial? I think it was about uh, two months. I think it was about a two month trial, and um, and quite a few uh, signed up. Uh, but a very small percentage, ultimately, at the end of the free trial, stayed with us. We ended up, I think our membership at that, I think our paid membership maybe at the end of the year was like 21 or maybe 27. It was something. It was a pretty small number. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it seemed, it seemed to work. But it wasn't it wasn't materially changing what dealers were doing because because it's it's always been clear that um, while a collector can use our database yes but there isn't any substitute of twenty years of experience okay. where you have you where you 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 know it's literally sometimes you can pick up the book. And, and, and it's almost like a deep intuition. It's the way the condition of the binding or maybe that little variation in the binding. Uh, you may have seen this book three or four times over the years and you go, this is different. Sure. It's very different. Well, the devil uh, is in the details for sure. I mean, I will say that it did force dealers uh, to justify the price margins that they charge. You know, you buy something at auction, if somebody can see what you paid, you better be able to add value in terms of research or explain why you got a bargain or what's different about it. Uh, and I think you really see that in catalog descriptions, which have sometimes grown into, uh, you know, many dissertations right. uh, over time. And I think that's, you know, due to the availability of the raw data for people to see. That is absolutely the case. And that has really been the goal that it's, there's good information on all sides, uh, my what I what I in trying to in the, in this in the '90s, I was starting to build a collection to build collections, um, and uh, I was just trying to uh, I was trying to create a definition of what would be a successful collecting experience. And what I concluded, this was very arbitrary, but it was just for myself. I just felt like, okay, uh, I, the pricing, the, the price that I pay has to be consistent with the idea that if I were to sell the material after 10 years, that I would get my money back. Sure. 10 years that not to make money, happy to own, to have had the, the excitement, the thrill of the material. But sure. I want to know if I put a million dollars into it, I want to see a million come back. Uh, and so you're basically like a uh, Buffett style value investor, except your dividends are in the enjoyment over the years from the material. That's a very accurate, that's a marvelous way to describe it. It's exactly that right. Uh, that, is, that is the way it is. Um, and uh, what I've seen over the years that um, that model is being widely applied. Uh, collectors, collectors love the material. There's a lot of people who love the material. Sure. But the, what 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 kind of stubs it off before they really it really flourishes into something substantial? Uh, if they if their early purchases turn out to be financially imprudent, uh, they walk away. Sure. You yeah. know, somebody may may have sold them fifty thousand dollars of material. But the minute they see that that material can is the its replacement value is twenty thousand dollars, sure. They just walk away. They find something else. They still want to collect, but they don't collect books. Yeah, that's that. And, uh, so, but it has been possible with this database. Um, it has it has made possible 
uh, for collectors to really build great collections. Um, you know, it, it's now that I'm 75, it's um, uh, outcomes are so different. You know, what, 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 what people need or want uh, are very, very different. Uh, but it does give, it gives people the opportunity to acquire material about which they feel emotion, emotionally resonant and, and, and to also simultaneously feel this was a smart idea. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about auction values. And I think this is particularly interesting, especially during the pandemic. How accurate are they in terms of data points of valuation? Because traditionally, auction houses sold to the trade. It was a wholesale value. They've essentially become full retail values. And in the past two years, at least from a dealer perspective, sometimes people can get carried away. They may bid out of ignorance online. And you may create a singular value that's somewhat distorted from what I would call uh, you know, a fair market price. Are you, are you suggesting that the copy of the Declaration of Independence, was that what it was? It sold for 42.9 uh, million or something? Well, that was a, a, that could be a good example. I think yeah. the Constitution it sold, but it sold a billionaire versus a group of you know people who uh, form some collective and paying with Bitcoin. <laughs> right. you know, these are singular events, but that's not an exceptional example. But you do see even single books these days, a frenzy of bidding, the excitement of auctions, pushing buttons on cell phones. And they sometimes can reach a value that I would be embarrassed as a dealer to even ask a client for. And that it's... Uh, um... Uh, auctions are emotional, but but it isn't that uh, it isn't that buying from dealers isn't emotional because I used to I can remember so clearly in the nineties uh, uh, I had every one of Bill Reese's catalogs uh, and uh, uh, Bill and I we had a regular routine was to have a call Friday afternoons and uh, Bill where's the catalog where is it Oh, it's in the press. Well, I'm looking forward to it. We get it to me here promptly because nothing worse than you, you get a catalog with wonderful things. Oh, they're sold. Hello, I sure. want to know when that damn thing's going to arrive. So uh, you, you, you get drawn, you get drawn into the, into the, into the process. And I, I am, uh, and I am aware that, I mean, people get carried away. Uh, uh, I guess well, overall, if you look at a benefit for your database, I mean, uh, you can look over the years at other copies, of course, to smooth out uh, you know, any outliers if you have some experience. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, uh, I mean, truly, uh, truly rare books probably have 25 appearances. Uh, and what that doesn't mean they're going to be every four years over tw over a hundred years. Sure, there may have been a bunch of them, and and particularly if they would have been in the in the nineteen twenties in that in the halcyon days of say from nineteen twenty four to twenty nine. I mean that was crazy. Those prices were wild. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah. And, the, um, but generally they've gone up over time. So. Uh... Well, yes and no, but I actually don't agree with that because the uh, if you take into account the declining value of the dollar, uh, uh, you you got to be a little careful about that calculation. Sure. Uh, uh, well, it, well, it is true. It's not Tesla stock, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know value, they have increased. You know, I think because of the uh, scarcity value of books, institutions buying them. Uh, Bruce, I don't know how much more time Zoom will permit us. Uh, they have a limit to the recording. So I just did want to say one thing about your database, which is important. You know, for the people who are not uh, experienced with it, I suggest they go on to rarebookhub.com. I'll put all of the information below. But you also have some very interesting features just besides pricing. You know, you have a 
listing of all of the book auctions, uh, most of them around the world that are coming up. Uh, you have keyword searches, you have reminder tools for specific things you may be collecting. Uh, and you also have once a month a newsletter, of course, which a lot of people read, which touches upon uh, fun and curious things, you know, in the rare book world and keeps everybody up to date. And, and I appreciate your description. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. Uh, what we're, we, we have felt, I wouldn't call it an obligation, but it, to call it a desire uh, to try to electronically recreate Main Street, uh, the world that we lived in 50 years ago, uh, where there would be some used bookshops somewhere in your town, that's mostly disappeared. And, um, uh, uh, and I have felt it was important to have um, people that are interested in this kind of material to feel a sense of community. That's I didn't want them to feel like they're just, uh, just to, you know, it's like, off in outer space, want you to understand you're inside of a world. Uh, that's why I think the ABAA fairs are so important because uh, I've written about this many times that when when they've, uh, 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 you know, in some of those fairs, the reported numbers of tickets sold or admissions, however it was yeah. done, but you know, somewhere between eight or 10,000 people thought to, to have come by. Uh, I mean, what that tells to me, that tells me how many the number of those people are, those are people who can feel that, that they are not outliers. They're actually part of something that is, that is almost a craving for people who understand history or the way you know, it, 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 the way this just comports to their re, their kind of understanding right. of reality. Uh, yeah. uh, so well, it's often it's I've always uh, said one of the biggest problems in attracting new collectors and everything is the dearth of bookstores as the gateway with which you would explore the rare book world. I mean, people come up to me at the fair if I've invited them and they say, oh, thank you for inviting me into this special world. And as you say, you've replaced the the bookstore, the rare and antiquarian store, as a lot of people's first entry, uh, you know, to explore the antiquarian world. So that is what we we do it, provide that, and it's stone cold free. There's yeah. never never been any any price for that. Uh, in order that because because even any minimal cost that you impose has a surprisingly big effect on the size of the audience. So. Uh, it's, uh, we feel, we feel very good to be part of, of community building that we, we do think in time that there will be kind of an aggregation of various forces that will come together to kind of, to, 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 to create a larger sense of the world book world. Uh, and it's, it is vital that the ABAA be strong. They need to be very, very healthy. Well, with that, with I'm glad, glad, glad to be a member of it. And uh, I think they're going to cut us off. So uh, I did want to say, uh, Bruce, thank you so much uh, you know, for having this conversation with me. I hope, you know, as you develop the site, you know, maybe you'll get into the metaverse. Uh, I would just have one suggestion. If you set up a virtual rare book hub there, you put an ice cream store next to it. So. <laughs> 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 it's um well anyway i'm thank you i'm i'm grateful that uh you uh invited us and um and i think i think what we can recognize we can both kind of reach we can kind of fist bump <laughs> on this we make common cause for the future of book collecting for you guys it's a business it's one kind of a business for us yeah it's a business, but that's never been primarily my, my goal. Sure. Um, but we have a shared, I, I think the reality is we have a shared destiny. And we're proud to be part of that. And we look forward to be with you guys for many, many years ahead.
Well, terrific. Well, thank you again. And I will encourage, like I said, everybody to check out rarebookhub.com and I'll put the link below. So I'll speak to you soon, Bruce. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Gotcha. Yeah, bye.